Okay. This I'm sorry for the um, reschedule, everybody. Um, I thought I had this perfect crime plan where I was going to run this tutorial and then have half an hour to get to the start of my trek that I did last week in New Zealand and then <laughs> and then like it would have all gone perfectly except for I didn't account for the time difference. So <laughs> <laughs> I would have been halfway up a mountain when the tutorial was supposed to be starting. Um, so apologies for having to reschedule, but we got there in the end and we'll just keep on going on the same schedule. So next week we're going to do glomerular diseases and then we'll be fortnightly from then on again. Um, did anybody do any chronic kidney disease reading in the lead up to this? Yes. A little bit, yeah. Well done, Josh. Um, and I know that Sam's been studying. Yep, so you're covered as well. Is there anything specific that you want to talk about with regards to chronic kidney disease? Because um, we've sort of done, we've talked about testing for renal disease and we've talked about acute kidney injury and how that happens. And obviously we all know that once it's been, that injury has been there for longer than three months, then we're dealing with chronic kidney disease. Um, nothing sort of too specific. You're happy for me to just work through the chapter kind of thing? Cool. Yeah. Um, the, this, I feel like kidney disease is hard to examine on because there's so many different components and I guess it's hard to sort of really understand whether somebody's got a solid background in it in a short answer question. But then in a long answer question, it's hard to be specific about what you want included in there. But I think when going through this chapter, the only question that really jumped out at me was um, describe, so as an example, describe three symptoms of chronic kidney disease and the etiopathogenesis of those clinical signs kind of thing. So how kidney disease causes clinical signs. So I thought we'd start this by talking through the different clinical signs we see and how they develop. And then the other question that I thought might be a good long answer question was um, describe how um, chronic kidney injury is self-perpetuating or something along those lines. And I would be very much more careful about the wording, but about sort of, you know, once one bit of the kidney gets damaged, the, this concept that we're talking about with acute kidney injury, that we've got the glomerulus, we've got the tubule, we've got the interstitium and we've got the blood vessel. And if you get a glomerular injury, you're going to get a tubular injury. If you get a tubular injury, you're going to get a glomerular injury. If you get a vascular injury, you're going to get an injury of the whole tubule. They're all interconnected. And then if you get swelling of the interstitium, you're going to get all three of those other components impacted. Um, so, and there's sort of different elements that we focus on as far as our treatment for kidney disease that help limit progression of kidney disease. So that's sort of try and structure this conversation around things that are potentially examinable um, and talk a bit about management with regards to the etiopathogenesis of kidney disease as well. So what's the symptom of, kidney, of chronic kidney disease that we see? PUPD, weight loss, anemia. Let's start with PUPD. What causes PUPD? Uh, that's that's renal driven. So uh, mm -hmm. they lose fluid first, and then they drink to compensate. So um, it's an inability of the tubules to concentrate the urine. Good. Um, and I'm not sure I can go much further than that. Good. So if you think about there's millions of tubules, and when you've lost half of them, you're starting to get poly polyuria. If you think about you've got half the number of nephrons and you've got more fluid moving through half, the, half of the nephrons than would have been moving through the whole nephron, the whole number of nephrons. So the tubular flow rate is drastically increased and glomerular flow rate is drastically increased in these patients. So for every kind of, if we need to lose a liter of fluid, and it's going through half the number of nephrons, then they're processing double the amount of fluid. 
And when fluid moves through the tubules really fast, how does that impact absorption, reabsorption? It makes it less. Makes it less, exactly. So we got solute drag because we've got increased electrolytes, increased glucose, increased protein moving through those tubules faster. And that's going to pull fluid in. So that's going to then increase the volume again. And then what happens when you've got, when you overload a patient with fluids, what happens to their ability to concentrate their urine? Oh, it would get worse, wouldn't it? Yeah. What's that called? Um, polyuria. <laughs> polyuria, yeah. So if we think about the interstitium and particularly in the medulla, how... Josh has got it. I saw a light bulb. Yeah. yeah. You turn like, like washout. So yes, we like kind of gradient. Um, so we, have, we lose our inability to have that gradient and um, good. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So we lose that concentration gradient with medullary washout, which means that the we lose that hypertonicity, and then the impact of ADH is decreased. Remember that. Um, but the aquaporins that facilitate water pouring in. <laughs> that proof, there's no difference in tone between the more hypertonic tubular fluid because it's got more solutes in it remember and the less hypertonic medullary interstitium then we're going to get less fluid resorbed so that's going to exacerbate polyuria even more good so increased solutes per nephron in medullary washout and decreased adh responsiveness as a three. All right. And then another clinical sign. Wait, weight loss. Yeah. Good. That's extreme, broad. <laughs> extreme cases you can get vomiting. Yes. Good. So do you want to talk about GIT signs? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So weight, I mean, weight loss is a little bit broad because we're going to get cachexia, cachexia as well as um, GIT signs. So vomiting and anorexia. I think Pooja mentioned anorexia before. Yeah. Um, anemia as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's mm. talk about GIT signs first. What are the mechanisms of GIT signs? Uremia is a big factor in causing nausea. Good. Um, and you also me? get yeah the brain mm -hmm. um, trigger zone, but the other part as well is you get um uremic gastropathy as well Good. that's okay. more i think like calcification of mucosa mm -hmm. um so you get, you get like just more like mucosal abnormalities more than anything is yep. yep so if you look at histo um there's mineralization of the stomach wall um do you know what the mechanism of that is is it to do with secondary renal parathyroidism yeah yeah and retention of phosphate so we've got increased calcium increased phosphate so therefore we get increased co tapo4 calcium phosphate <laughs> deposition um so that's one of the main mechanisms and then the other one um which really does contribute they think the most to the gastric changes is the inability to to excrete gastrin which is renally excreted. So almost all cats in particular with um, chronic kidney disease of stage three or higher will have a hypergastronemia. Do you remember what gastrin does? Does it help increase secretion um, of acid? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got hypergastronemia, what are we going to get? Ulceration. Eh? Oh, more yep. predisposing to ulceration. Yep, absolutely. So we're going to de decrease the pH in the stomach and um, develop ulceration. He, so what effect is the acid going to have on the calcium phosphate? The acid shouldn't have any effect on the calcium phosphate, but what it will do is if it causes inflammation, it will increase blood flow to the area, which will increase deposition of calcium phosphate. Mm. 
Um, what about where else do we see ulcers in the GIT tract other than the stomach in according to kidney failure dogs and cats? Or order. So that's who said that? Yeah, Sam. Um, I haven't uh, seen them with a mouth ulcer though in a long time. No, they don't get that bad anymore, do they? Often. I don't know. I feel like when I was younger, I saw some, but I can't even remember one now. Mm. I've seen a couple, couple with really severe chronic kidney failure. So like creatinine of 1500 renal dysplasia dogs. And I would say dogs more than cats. And they get the oral ulceration, but they also get that. Um, has anyone seen the, the tips of the, the tongue tip? Around the edge of the tongue. Yeah. The mm. margins of the tongues just get really ulcerated. Um, so that's called fibrinoid necrosis. And it's a chronic kidney injury or autoimmune disease thing. Mm. I saw that with a IMHA dog I had recently that was on high mm. dose PRED. And I was, mm. and it also had signs of, chronic blood loss as well so it's very confusing but i think it was i thought it was bleeding from its tongue or something oh wow interesting but it sounds like exactly what you described i've not seen that before oh mm. it is fine in this one yeah. but it was all I that. Feel that it was on pred because normally that's kind of i mean complex deposition yeah it had really bad teeth so i was wondering whether there was some kind of um, flare -up and it was yeah. inflammation yeah. due to contact yeah. but yeah anyway sorry off track yeah. Interesting. Um, so lots of different mechanisms for GRT signs, which we've covered most of them, but combination of central and local changes. What's another sign that we see? Who just said anemia? Oh, anemia. Yeah, let's talk about anemia. Good. Yeah. What's the cause? Very quick word. <laughs> Yeah, EPO deficiency. Good. Why? Um, predominantly producing the kidneys. So if you have decreased kidney function, then you just get decreased production, I think, is the main, main thing. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. So decreased could, EPO. I was, I was wondering, could it also be, because I think there's sensors in the kidneys as well, if they're not functioning? I don't know. I can't remember. Macula denser or something. Yeah. I think that one does chloride. I think it does the yeah, it's too glomerular. <laughs> yeah, one of the two. I can't remember. I just a decreased functional renal mass means decreased EPO production. Sure. Um, is all the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> There's something about two, three DPG and the shift, right shift of the oxyhemoglobin curve, but yeah, that was not for membership level. <laughs> Josh, Josh, you might need to know that at some point in your career. <laughs> I can forget it now. Um, there's a couple of other causes of anemia, one of which we've just talked about in the gastrointestinal gastric changes. Blood loss from Blood loss. duration. Yep. Probably an iron deficiency secondary to chronic yep. blood loss, maybe mm -hmm. even. B12 mm -hmm. deficiency as well, maybe. Yeah. Um, Anemia of chronic disease. Yes, good. Yeah. Um, what about the lifespan of red blood cells, particularly in cats? Would that be normal in a patient with... Reduced. Uh, reduced, yeah, exactly. Um, so any inflammatory disease will result in oxidant damage, particularly cats who are very susceptible to um, oxidant damage of their red cells. And the red cell life expectancy is reduced, lifespan is reduced. Okay, other symptoms? Hypertension. What are the, what's the symptom? What do we see with hypertension? I keep actually, oh, um... If it's very advanced renal disease, then you'll see uh, hemorrhage, retinal detachment and things. But that, that's mm -hmm. if it's really advanced, not in the uh, initial stages. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So occasionally they'll present with blindness. Um, or what is another 
a target organ that is impacted by hypertension? Brain, heart. Brain, brain. Have you ever seen a dog or cat with encephalopathy associated with renal disease? I haven't seen, but I'm aware that I haven't, I haven't seen. I can't find the... Uh... Josh, have you? Um, I'm just trying to think. I don't... If it had it, I probably didn't know. Mm. Yeah. I think I've probably told you about a case that I had that came in in status. It was like a three-year-old beagle. Yeah. Um, and in hindsight, he'd been mentally obtunded for quite a while, associated with profound acidosis, I would say. But um, I went to intubate him because he came in having see been seizuring for a, a year, uh, not a year, an hour, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to open his jaw and I just bent in half. Yeah. It was amazing. Which brings us to our next symptom. <laughs> <laughs> well, second reading of that Good. Okay. Um, so how would that manifest? What will you see clinically? Um, yeah, like decreased bone density. Mm -hmm. uh, calcification of the kidneys as well. Mm hmm yeah um when you say decreased bone density where will you see that which bones tend to be most affected oh. well the, the mandibles obviously yes yeah what's the name of that the later layman's terms for no, not the not the long bones <laughs> the, the, the axial skeleton good yeah, yeah. So, rubber jaw Yes, rubber jaw, exactly. Yep. I'm going to make this like a trivia. Dan gets a point. <laughs> um, yes, rubber jaw. So, um, mandibles predominantly affected in renal secondary hyperparathyroidism, long bones predominantly affected in nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, so, I, I don't reckon I'll ever see that, that case again, but it was such a good example. Yeah. It's certainly very rare. I don't think I've ever yeah. seen one. Yeah. It was amazing at the time. Isn't the rubber jaw breed related to like Scottish? Oh, I don't know, actually. I don't know. A Scotties, did you say? Yes. Oh, really? I'm going to have to Google that. Yeah, I would. Google's more reliable than I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, okay, see my note. All right, what's the mechanism of renal secondary hyperparathyroidism? So what's happening in the bones? Why do they get soft? It's, oste it's osteoclastic. So mm -hmm. it's, um, I'll butcher it, but it's, a, it's, it's due to the hyperphosphatemia. So mm -hmm. that impacts um, FG23. I'm not sure how, um, which then decreases your vitamin D. Um, production in the or sorry mm -hmm. conversion in the kidneys I think it is mm -hmm. so without vitamin D you don't get um, GIT reabsorption of cal or absorption of calcium so that then feeds back on the parathyroid to tell it to produce more parathyroid hormone um, is that kind of it yep um, <laughs> did so it tries to increase blood calcium by taking calcium from bones yeah, exactly. Um, so in health, what would normally happen is phosphate level creeps up, like you have a high protein meal or you get dehydrated and don't excrete as much. And your body will produce this fibro fibroblast growth factor, 23, FGF 23. And that directly causes phosphaturia. Um, if then, so let me get this, make sure I've got this straight. So what is the impact of calcitriol on, you talked about calcium resorption in the gastrointestinal tract. What's its impact on phosphate? Don't remember. Not sure. The calcitriol. In, but I don't remember. Calcitriol increases phosphate absorption. So we, if you've got increased phosphate, you don't want calcitriol. 
So if you think, think about that, phosphate increases, you're going to get decreased calcitriol because you don't want to be reabsorbing any more phosphate. And what is the interaction between calcitriol and PTH? Mm. Um, I'm guessing it in increases it. Yeah, it decreases. Sorry, decreases it. Um, yeah, it decreases it. it. Exactly. Yeah. But they both do the same thing to calcium. So if you've got high calcitriol, then you don't need as much PTH. So calcitriol inhibits PTH. So if you've got a decrease in calcitriol because of your high phosphate, you're going to lose inhibition of your PTH and PTH is going to climb. This is exactly what Josh said. I'm just trying to, um, uh, I guess it's a really difficult concept and I want to make sure everybody's got it clear. Does that make sense, Sam? You've got a mm. no face on. I literally just wrote down, look this up more. <laughs> Me too. It's right I, here. Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't have a grasp on renal secondary hyperparathyroidism according to this conversation. Yeah. Well, I just realized is, I don't know it well enough. This is pretty but, in depth. And I have to say, this to comprehend this without looking at a flow sheet of how it's working is, is almost impossible. So I should have probably got a picture up to share with you guys. But the most important thing is high phosphate, low calcitriol, which ends up with high PTH. Um, and high PTH is going to try and increase the calcium absorption in the GIT retention in the kidneys and also increase osteoclastic activity in the bone. Um, I think it would be reasonable at a membership level to say, um, describe the impact calcitriol or oh, hyperphosphatemia has on calcitriol and PTH or something like levels or something like that. But I would never, ever ask an open-ended question where people might think that they would need to write down this flowchart of what FGF 23 and one alpha hydroxylase is doing in the kidney. Um, Josh, you need to know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've battled with calcium metabolism for four decades. I still don't follow it completely. I feel so like I, I just... need to revise it every six months. Mm. Mm. Um. I can't tell you any more about it, I don't think. Sorry. <laughs> Can I ask, Banana, is it very common to use it in treatment of chronic kidney at like the specialist level? Because there's someone on VIN who over the years has always been really into renal and calcium and calcitriol and all of those things. But mm -hmm. I've actually never had a patient including my own cat that I treated with it or that I sent and got treated with it. Mm. Um, uh, equivocal evidence in cats that it's of any benefit with chronic kidney disease. Uh, do you mean treating with calcitriol? Yeah, I think so. And yeah. I've never really quite understood because I haven't seen it commonly in real life. Yeah. Um, there's a significant decrease in mortality and increased life expectancy in dogs with chronic kidney disease treated with calcitriol, okay. but only if phosphate and calcium are ionized calcium are regularly monitored. And that's the big limitation yeah. for people doing it in um, GP is that ionized okay. calcium is so difficult to measure. Uh, but yes, all dogs with CKD of stage th iris stage three to four um, should be on calcitriol according to the, um, according to the, Hmm. Iris guidelines. Okay. Thank you. No worries. 
Right. That's most of the clinical signs that we see. Let's talk a little bit about how how renal failure progresses after the sort of initial injury and once you've got a couple of sort of um, functions not working in the kidneys. So I don't really know how to structure this without just telling you about it, but let's talk about hypertension because we started there. How does hypertension contribute to progression of renal disease? Go on, Josh. I think it injures the glomerulus um, just because it's already a hypertensive area. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I guess a rupture. Yep. Um, So when you get leakage of those, so increased pressure in the glomerulus, what will happen to the rest of the kidney? To, sorry, to the rest of that, like, functional unit, that nephron. That would be pressurised sort of in every direction, wouldn't it? Mm. Both vascularly and uh, probably luminally. Yep. So with hypertension, we get endothelial activation and damage. Will, we get inflammation and damage of the endothelium. And what happens when the endothelium gets damaged? Leaks. Leaks, good, into a very confined space, the glomerular capsule, which then causes swelling and compression of the glomerular capillaries. And then remember that blood supply comes into the glomerulus, comes around, forms an ultrafiltrate, ultra but then that blood supply forms the blood supply to that entire nephron. So if you squash that capillary, and you've got damaged endothelium, how do you think the blood supply to the rest of the nephron is going to be? That's true. Yes, decreased blood blood flow to the rest of the kidney, exactly. So you risk losing the nephron with glomerular damage like that. And as soon as you get the mesangium, we're going to talk about glomerular anatomy more next week, but the mesangium is the kind of connective tissue that surrounds those capillaries. Um. As soon as you get swelling in there and constriction, uh, it increases risk of thrombosis of those vessels and that just knocks out the entire nephron. Um, What about what happens after you've lost a few nephrons? What tissue is dead tissue replaced by? It would be calcified, wouldn't it? It can become calcified. So if you um, have, say, a renal infarct and you've got a wedge of kidney tissue that has been just completely died off, become necrotic and died off, what's, what's that sort of wedge end up looking like? I don't know. It's like fibrocoic and fibrous. Blood, so it's like fibrous. Fibrous, exactly. So when tissue dies, it's replaced by fibrous tissue. And if you think about the kidney, you lose one nephron and it's replaced by fibrous tissue, then the nephron next to it doesn't really have much room to expand, move, places more pressure on that um, vasa recta vessel and less compliance of the kidney to accommodate edema or inflammatory infiltrates that we see. Um, back to glomerular damage, sorry, and how it perpetuates kidney injury. Once we've talked about swelling of the mesangium and compression of the impact that that will have on the blood vessel, what impact will it have on the ultrafiltrate if the podocytes are damaged and leaky? Get more protein. Good. Going through into the tubule. And what's that going to do to the tubule? I can uh, hypertonic. Yeah, good. So it's going to be really hard to absorb fluid out of there. It's going to exacerbate the polyuria. What do we see when we look at urine 
or what is a higher line cast? Oh gosh, the, the higher line. No, someone yeah, else can answer that. <laughs> hmm? Like a dead tubule, pretty much. Like it's the uh, inside of the tubule sloughing off. Off, I think. Uh, so usually that's um, granular cast, I think. Oh right. Okay. Is it protein then? Cellular cast. It's protein. High line is protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the protein itself clogs up the particularly distal convoluted tubule and causes obstruction of the tubule and we can lose the whole nephron. The other thing it does is activates a lot of um, pro-inflammatory um, pathways in the proximal tubule as it goes through. So then we get granular casts as well because we get infl inflammation, sloughing of, it, of the tubular epithelial cells into the tubule. And then, um, again, blockage of the tubule. Hmm. So we've talked about, talked about most things, development of fibrosis. The only thing we haven't really talked about is mineralization, and Jeff mentioned it. How will mineralization or mineral deposits in the kidney impact progression? Is it because it's calcium deposits? So again, mm. it's like functional space sort of thing. Yes, it takes up space. Will cause obstruction of a tubule if it happens in a tubule, um, or protect potentially in the collecting system, in the um, calyces or renal pelvis, and can potentially cause obstruction of sort of individual tubules or a whole sort of section of the kidney or a whole kidney potentially if it's ureteral, and exacerbate damage that way. That's a bit deep pathophysiology-wise. Sorry. No, that was really good. Right. Uh, good to think about that. Um, well, you always say that, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well, it's what Josh needs to yeah. stimulate him to learn oh, more. We all need it. We all need it. It's what, I, what, what, what goads me to uh, remember everything that I've forgotten. I think it's uh, the re I don't want to go into too much detail and it's, it's not something that I'd ever examine on. I don't think. Um, but I do think it's good to have in your head how important it is to manage hypertension, manage glomerular hypertension, um, manage development of fibrosis and mineral deposits. And then when you sort of then talking about treatment, which we'll go into next, we, we understand why we're doing what we're doing. So let's, what, if you've got a patient who, uh, so it, say it's a 12-year-old cat and the creatinine is 180 um, and the client hasn't reported anything, it's incidental finding on a blood test pre-dental. Uh, urine-specific gravity is 1020. What is your advice going to be for how we manage this patient? Um, if I think with that one, it'd be, I guess you want to look for other causes of creatinine elevation and polyuria. So probably checking, checking those first. Mm -hmm. So good history examination and also checking urine. Mm -hmm. But if it truly is CKD in this scenario, um, I guess that's that would be I think stage one. Mm. So the recommendation probably would just be a diet change to a renal diet. I think for that stage. For stage one, I believe so. Mm. Um, as long as phosphate's not too high. But. Um. Uh. Good. So it's actually stage two. Okay. So I agree with you, changing to a renal diet is indicated. Why am I balking at changing to a renal diet in stage one renal disease? They may not need a protein restriction at that level. So yeah. excellent. Um, and then you could be, yeah, they may not need it. Yeah. So what is, I don't, the iris stages are so easy to look up. That's not something that's kind of examinable. I would never sort of say to you, what stage is this kidney cat? with a creatinine of 180. Um, 
but it's really important clinically to differentiate between them because the particularly that diet recommendation changes um so stage one is actually normal creatinine but a known renal injury so either increasing creatinine from baseline of 15 percent over three months or um something that's we know is going to continue to injure the kidney so persistent hypertension or persistent proteinuria even if there's no change in creatinine, we call that a stage one because they're high risk. But those patients, it's not indicated to change the diet yet. Like Josh said, if you restrict protein in patients that um, have still normal creatinine levels, they become calorie deficient and their outcomes are actually worse long-term, not calorie deficient, but they lose body condition, muscle condition, and their outcomes are worse than if you'd left them on the, the normal diet and allowed them to maintain their muscle condition as long as possible. So we switched them to protein restricted diet at stage two. Why protein restriction? What is it about protein that um, we're trying to decrease? Uh, I think it's to try and decrease uremia um, from protein catabolism. Mm -hmm. It's not just protein, it's also phosphate, isn't it? Like you don't want the phosphate, like that's the other thing no one really talks about. Exactly, yeah. So um, protein is phosphate, essentially, once it's all broken down. Um, so they're, they're sort of the same thing. And yes, we do see urea and creatinine elevations with high protein diets, but um, the main thing is decreasing the phosphate level in the diet. Um, so the stats are that with... Phosphate restriction from stage two and up, cats have a three times longer survival um, relative to cats that didn't have phosphate restriction. And then dogs have a, it's worded differently because dog studies were separate from cat studies, but a 66% decreased mortality in dogs on phosphate restriction. So really profound impact on longevity of these patients from stage two and upwards um so the diet the predominant thing is phosphate restriction is there anything else that we that the diets do that um we will improve quality and quantity of life you could put fluid in there as well if i need better hydration good excellent no oh there it is sorry um yeah, exactly. So why is hydration important in kidney cats? Um, we want to make sure that any pre-renal azotemia is corrected. Uh, they need to be, and they're always polyuric, so losing fluid. Mm -hmm. It's certainly uh, more than a normal cat, so they have to replace that. Um, and often, and sometimes they, if they don't, they um, become, can become unwell. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, um, we want to make sure that kidneys perfused in that way so. yeah exactly cats tend to err on the side of hypoperfusion um just they're not driven to drink so if we can improve renal perfusion by increasing water intake by forcing them that's um, beneficial for survival um oral supplementation of fluid is better than subcutaneous in terms of outcomes but if you can't get oral fluid in, the recommendation is either place a feeding tube for long-term use um, to administer water or administer subcutaneous fluids. The, uh, just adding water to their food, they'll take it. It, it surprised me all the time that they'll eat the food and take the water as well. Mm. I've never had a cat refuse, which really is astounding. Yeah. I've had, a f I've had a few. The ones that I've really struggled with are the cats that have always had dry food and all of a sudden you're trying to give them wet dry food or wet food and they're like, nah, I eat crunchy bicky things. Mm. Um, You've got to add the water straight away. I mean, no one likes soggy cornflakes either. So, um. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Um, I had a hell of a time converting my own cat onto wet food when he obstructed. But um, we got there in the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yes, good. So food does hydration, it does phosphate restriction. What else? I think this, no, no, I've got to say pH control, but. Yes, that's exactly what I was after. Um, so what, if you did blood gases in chronic kidney failure patients, would they lean towards alkalemia or acidemia? Acidemia. acidemia. Good, why? Sorry. It's more gastric. <laughs> more gastric, good, yeah. It's more, more local in the stomach, but. <laughs> it's they have, um, and usually they have, if you're doing blood gases, they'll usually have metabolic acidosis. Yes. Yeah. Good. What are their tubules not reabsorbing to create that imbalance? Bicarb. Good. Bicarb, exactly. So they lose bicarb more relative to their hydrogen. Renal tubular acidosis. Um, so uh, the... Most of the foods have um, citrate or similar, like an alkalinizer in it, and also potassium because the potassium, they're often hypokalemic, aren't they, just because of tubular washout or decreased intake. So um, that potassium balance, you know, when they get hypokalemic, you get hydrogen and potassium swapping over and... Um, impacting acid base balance, acid base, you know what I mean. Mm. <laughs> like acids. <laughs> um, yeah, so the food just kind of does the, the the prescription diets just do that. But when you sort of work through what they're actually doing, they're actually targeting a lot of different aspects of um, renal disease. So let's talk about hypokalemia now that we've talked about um, hydrogen. What is the risk of hypokalemia in these patients? In a normal chronic case, uh, I mean, it's not too bad unless they, again, are not eating, vomiting, then they can become. So if there's an acute on chronic onset, then mm. I think this is more significant as opposed to just a happy CKD cat who's just or dog treading along. Yeah, so... so um, typically, their whole body potassium is a little bit depleted, so they're normally low end of normal or just a tiny bit low. It's because they can't reabsorb it because it's moving through the tubules too fast. Um, what, when you've got low potassium, it actually impairs ADH responsiveness as well. So it's actually just going to exacerbate that polyuria. So um, the JFMS consensus statement on management of CKD recommends that all cats with stage two or above are given potassium citrate as both an alkalinizer and a potassium supplement to minimize the impact of that on ADH responsiveness. Um, and then another electrolyte that we tend to be a bit conservative on with um, uh, renal diets because we are trying to avoid hypertension is sodium. What's going to happen if you restrict sodium in the diet to the RAS system? Lactivated. Hmm? Lactivated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you're going to have a little bit more. Um, fluid retention, drive to fluid retention, which the kidneys can't really respond to because they've lost function. Um, but when you've then got increased antithrombin, angiotensin, sorry, <laughs> wrong AT. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've activated RAS, you've got um, a kind of uh, shift towards a hypertensive kind of hormone profile. Uh, so um, sodium restriction, whilst it sort of helps with hyper, hypertension, can also exacerbate it from a kind of, um, you know, that perspective. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've lost my words. Renin production would be affected too, wouldn't it? It would be effective if we had re efficient okay. renin inhibitors, yeah. 
uh, now affected. I mean, with, oh with yes, it will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for two reasons: decreased production, but also um, can't excrete it. Um, what about anemia? How are we going to manage the anemia? I mean, it depends on how bad it is, I guess, but mm -hmm. can give like a, a double point to yeah. try and boost it up, but mm -hmm. it's not as, you know, I guess you don't do it that common, commonly, unless it's no. really. Um, so the guidelines for using DABO is PCV less than 25. It's like birds going nuts. Um, less than 25 and um, it always should be given with iron because these patients are usually iron deficient. Um, what about the hypogastronemia? Probably got protected, so I think sucralfate. I can use sucralfate. Um, Omeprazole is probably more mm, direct yes. because it's, yeah, directly on the mm. um, proton pump, inhib inhibition of that proton pump. So it's going to just decrease the impact of that hypogastronemia, which is um, the cause of the gastropathy. But doesn't the consensus statement for gastropathy say that it doesn't actually, like there's no evidence to show that you actually need to use this? Yeah, so the evidence to use it would be hematomesis right. yeah. Yeah. or evidence of pro, uh, of um, chronic blood loss without mm -hmm. any other explanation. So if you had an iron deficiency anemia um, that was more than just a chronic um, anemia of chronic disease, then it would be warranted. So when you're saying iron deficient anemia, you're just looking at micro, like microcytic hypochromic anemia. Is that what you're just looking exactly. at? Yep. Yeah, exactly. We rarely do iron studies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the microcytosis is a giveaway that it's iron deficient yeah, and hypochromic. Um, what about proteinuria? What are we going to do? Mm. Uh, what's the significance of the proteinuria? It is significant. It's a class of substaging because it actually perpetuates renal uh, disease. However, exactly. you need to, uh, I think you need to first make sure it's not an active sediment and then do the UPC. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so what if you did get an active sediment? Then, then you clear that and then you do it. <laughs> How do you think of that? <laughs> so what are the indications? So it, my question is, you know, UTIs happen often in patients with chronic, chronic renal failure. When do you treat? This is a very debatable topic. Like mm. I think ideally you shouldn't be treating subclinical, but then with the antimicrobial stewardship, but then these patients have structural disease. So that is not a complicated UTI to begin with. Any, it's a, sorry, it's not a non-complicated, it's a complicated UTI. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I think, I don't know which side of the fence you want to sit on. Um, so the guidelines do say if there's pyuria, treat. Treat, yeah. Yeah. So even if they're non-clinical, because the cats don't tell you if they're clinical often, they might weigh outside sure. um, or if there's a decrease in renal function, you're allowed to treat it. So definitely screen for infection in cats with lower, uh, with chronic kidney disease, um, but only treat if there's pyuria, reduction in renal function or systemic signs. Um, Is there a, like a degree to pyuria or any pyuria? Like, you know, sometimes with the wet gnostics just gives you a leukocyte number and greater than 10. Then is that significant? What's significant? Oh, if it's greater than 10, it's significant. Yeah, okay. there should, yeah, shouldn't be more than 10. Mm -hmm. Um so back to proteinuria. So we've still got proteinuria after we've cleared our UTI. What are we going to do about it? Should treat it. Treat it. Good. We you can treat it with calcium channel blockers or ACE and Yes, yeah, yeah, so what the Go again, Josh, sorry. Or, it, or an angiotensin receptor blocker. Good. Yeah. So Just there are the flavor. Yeah. There are three options for management of proteinuria. 
what um so say you had hypertension and proteinuria what's your first choice going to be there's not a right answer here just by the way probably an ACE inhibitor or, or a angiotensin, angiotensin receptor blocker how come not calcium channel blocker um Hello. Not sure, to be honest. Yeah, I've always started going with an ACE inhibitor first line for those because of the, I mean, they're not great at hypertension, I suppose. Mm. Like, you get like a 5% reduction or something, but mm. um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really think there's a right answer. And actually, I would probably treat dogs and cats differently. And I'd probably treat differently if I had a like systolic of 220 as opposed to a systolic of 170 sort of thing. So if I had a dog with a systolic of 170, I think an ACE inhibitor is probably appropriate. But if I had a cat with a systolic of 240, I'm probably going to go for amlodipine just because I know it's going to bring the blood pressure down fastest. Um, and then I've said venalipril and amlodipine, but actually I know that the studies that are coming out of the and um, Symmetra, <laughs> I'm just going to call it Symmetra. Um, Still yeah. 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 exactly. Um, are that it's superior to both in terms of both reducing hypertension and proteinuria. Um, so it's just kind of habit that comes with my prescribing habits, but either all of them are appropriate choices. Um, some interest probably the, the best choice when you've got concurrent renal disease and hypertension and proteinuria, but if there, it was the stage one, we had proteinuria and hypertension, I might just go for hypertension management rather than the Symmetra. Yeah. Um, any would be appropriate, but it's important to know that ACE inhibitors just don't really make that much of a difference on your um, blood pressure. So average change is about 10 millimeters. So if you're starting at 240, you're going to be working pretty hard. Um, what are the contraindications for an ACE inhibitor? Um, I guess it can be further progress kidney disease. So if you have an, a creatinine increase, um, that would be probably a contraindication. So like a 20% increase or 25% increase, they'd probably be worried that we're causing more harm in that scenario. Yeah, good. So they've got to be hydrated. Um, otherwise you can exacerbate renal injury. And what about... How are we going to monitor our proteinuria, our response to therapy? Repeat UPCRs. Mm -hmm. How much variability is there on day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour protein in urine? There is variation. That's why I think you should do it like three or four days, collect and then things like that. Mm, yeah, that's ideal. Um, but it, it's it can be really hard to determine whether you're making a difference with medication because there can be sort of greater than 100% variations from day to day or hour to hour in UPCR. So the, there's one reference, I think it was in CVT or something that said pull the samples over three, first morning samples over three days and then have, and that kind of gives you an average, which is a nice way of doing it um, if the owners are down for that. Um, but I wouldn't change sort of doses and things wildly without, um, uh, just based on a bit of variation, like if it's just gone up by 20% or something like that, I wouldn't add in another medication, for example. Mm. All right. I've covered actually everything I wanted to cover. Has anybody got anything else they wanted to talk about? Just very briefly, the RAS activation reminded me, like with cardio renal syndrome, mm -hmm. like these mm -hmm. are really hard to manage. <laughs> really hard to manage. Hard to kill them. Yeah. Is that like, do you have any tips on that or what do you do? <laughs> Such a tightrope. Um, oh, yeah, I don't have any tips. <laughs> have you read the paper? There's a good paper on oh, um, I'll I'll flick it out to you. So I've got two jobs, Google Rubber Jaw and Scotty's and send out the <laughs> cardio renal um, syndrome. When I say good paper, I really didn't enjoy it, but 
you might. Yeah. <laughs> uh, does anybody else want that? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sam? Yeah. Don't have to read it. Um, okay. I didn't like it. Hey? Why, why, why didn't you like it? Was it the answer was to just kill them? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> There's no, I, it's just like monitor more, do more, meddle more. It's all just fine tuning and yeah, I, ugh, the terminal. That's just, yeah. I had a very, um, I, I'd like to share with you guys because I don't know, I've never seen this sort of an impact. I had a 14 year old Chihuahua last Sunday because I also do ED sometimes. Mm -hmm. I had a 14 year old Chihuahua come in for not eating and vomiting. So uh, convinced the owners to do bloods because the previous day had gone to RegVet, got some meropatent and sent home. When mm -hmm. I did bloods, the creatinine on one on 20 dilution was one uh, 1,500 and something. So really oh. high. <gasps> so obviously had a big discussion and said, this is not something we can correct very quickly. Now I don't have the history. So I don't know if this is like acute on chronic onset or just an AKI. At this point, it is an AKI, but whether there's an acute on chronic onset. So admitted, owners wanted to persist. It's a 14-year-old chihuahua. They wanted to persist. Also had a, I did a focus and mu like, I think there was early mucosal as well. So angiopathy as well. So then I admitted uh, side fluids, just supportive treatment. The next day we repeated the creat and it was uh, in the evening, it had dropped down to 200. That jump, like that drop, I have never seen or heard. Have you ever come across something like that? Or is it an, like I'm really thinking, was it a machine error? To begin no, okay. um, yeah because this is like i cannot comprehend you, can't, you can't it's not possible right like yeah the kidneys can't excrete that much creatinine okay over 24 hours I don't yeah know. it's just oh i can't get over it <laughs> well, yeah, i mean we've had them sort of half over 24 yeah. hours and we're yeah. like wow but yeah n not not like nearly 20 normal. dilution was over 1500 and the next day it is 200 i'm like i i don't know what to say i would do <laughs> no was the, dog, was the dog like a tundid when it came in was it uh, like I called it moderately because when I put her on the floor, she was a female spade chihuahua. I put her on the floor, she sort of walked two steps, then sat down. So, upturned uh, 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 yeah, but not, but still like sort of ambulatory and aware. Like she would look up at me, but like really dead. Yeah. So dog, dogs are really impacted by change in creatinine. So, if a dog's like 200, still presumably you've only just corrected the dehydration. When you got the 200 if that dog's gone from 200 to 1500 acutely he would be in status like it would be an absolute disaster yes, so yeah that's why i just yeah this doesn't okay cool. yeah even that and i'm assuming that to, like 200 is the baseline there where realistically it's probably actually lower than that um so yeah i think it must have been an error yeah mm -hmm. that would make more sense than that because i just can't get over this <laughs> yeah god it's such a yeah the uh, the lesson was never uh, because obviously the first day I was saying to the owners this is a long term like you have significant money blah 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 euthanasia is an option but then like the lesson is that maybe not to offer it gung ho euthanasia just wait and see what happens over the twenty four hour period. It is also a fourteen year old hour with me. Yes. <laughs> probably thought you were you were amazing. Yes, you fixed it. Well done. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Have a lovely day, everybody. We'll see Thank you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.